Francisco, are we, are we recording? Yeah, okay. Welcome back to Respiration 2. I think this is where we left off. Uh, talk about different you know, circulation, the pulmonary circulation, we know what that is already between the heart and the lungs, bringing uh, uh, the oxygen blood to the uh, lungs from the right side of the heart. Okay, and we have gas exchange in the lungs. All right. Then we have something called a bronchial uh, circulatory system. Well, this is a uh, this is a separate uh, uh, branch. This is actually up the left side of the heart. This is bringing oxygenated blood uh, from the left side of the heart to the conducting zone cells. They don't get oxygen by uh, us breathing it in and, and coming across the conducting zone cells. They have to have their own supply of oxygenated blood from the left side of the heart. Those are the bronchial arteries. So we got two sets of uh, blood going to the lungs, the pulmonary deoxygenated from the right side of the heart, and the bronchial circulation bring oxygenated blood to the conducting zone cells um, from the left side of the heart. Okay. Lymph drainage. Remember, there's almost uh, it's a lot of, well, uh, there's very little lymph made in the uh, in the lungs uh, because it's very you know, it's a tissue fluid. Um, there's uh, you don't want fluid build up in the lungs. There's very little fluid in the lungs, and uh, so we have to prevent a pulmonary edema. Very little lymph, you know, very little interstitial fluid because uh, the osmotic pressure. Remember, we have to go back to capillary hydrodynamics. That on the remember on the arterial side of the capillaries, hydrostatic pressure, we're in osmotic uh, pressure, so fluid comes out of capillaries. And then on the venous side, remember the hydrostatic pressure drops over the course of the capillary. So now on the venous side, the osmotic pressure is higher than the hydrostatic pressure, so fluid comes into the Well. In the lungs, it's not like that. Osmotic pressure is always greater than hydrostatic pressure, even on the arterial side, because of, because the uh, pulmonary system is a much lower pressure system than a systemic system. Uh, so the pressure is so much lower that osmotic pressure is always greater than hydrostatic pressure, and there's almost no uh, secretion. Uh, the, uh, of fluid out of capillaries in the lungs. It's all reabsorbed here because the osmotic pressure is always greater than the hydrostatic. Okay. Now, this is, I'm sure the last time the video, uh, not the last third or so of the video, the, uh, uh, the lecture, the video was knocked out. And I thought maybe something wrong with the camera, but it was because I was kicking a stupid plug out of the ground. And I kicked it out. And I'm gonna be tri tripping over it the whole time now. Who, who puts a plug in the ground, in the floor? I don't know. Okay, I'm just venting. Okay, innervation. The lungs are innervated by both um, branches of the autonomic nervous system. Sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic causes bronchodilation, resistance, Re reduction of resistance to flow. Parasympathetic causes proper constriction, increases resistance to flow. And does this make sense to you? Yeah, it should. I think I mentioned this in the last lecture. If you're in a fight or flight situation, an emergency situation, you need a lot of oxygen. You want a bronchial dilation, and that's the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight. If you're relaxed and not and, and, and sedentary, you don't need that much of oxygen, you can constrict those, those uh, vessels in the parasympathetic nervous system, nervous system takes over. Okay. Or right, pleural membranes and cavity, we mentioned this before, I think in the last lecture, visceral pleura on top of the, uh, covering the lungs, 
a plural, um, uh, oh, that should be parietal plural. This would provide a plural, right? parietal lining nuclear cavity, but there really isn't any space in the plural cavity because the lungs are flashing up against the inside of the uh, uh, of the cavity. So the parietal and visceral are right next to each other because of what's called interpleural pressure, which is below that of atmosphere. Uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. So it's a potential cavity. There is, it really isn't a cavity there. Well, there it is right there. Um, so we have uh, um, two pleural cavities in the thoracic cavity. And uh, there's the uh, lung. And inside the lung is called intrapulmonary pressure. And in the pleural cavity is intrapleural pressure. And intrapleural pressure is always lower than intrapulmonary pressure. That's why the lung is flat against the inside of the portal cavity. And there really is no cavity. And that's going to be required for breathing. We'll get to that in a, in a little bit there. OK. So pressures, intrapleural, intrapulmonary. So we're going to have actually three pressures. This pressure out here is atmospheric pressure. Pressure inside your lungs, intrapulmonary pressure. Pressure in, in the intra, in the pleural cavity, intrapleural pressure. And you're going to have to keep these three pressures in uh, in mind. Okay. So functions of the pleural and pleural fluid. Remember, there is fluid in there. If we, these are serous membranes that secrete this watery serous fluid, it's like all body cavities just about. Uh, reduction of friction. So you breathe in, you know, the, the, the lungs get sliding into the pleural cavity and you don't adhere. Just like in the pericardial cavity, there's a watery fluid there that allows your heart to beat and slide in the pericardial cavity. Cre creation of pressure gradient. So remember, I just said there's always a pressure gradient between your pleural and your pulmonary. Your plural is always lower than your pulmonary. All right. Compartmentalization. What that means is you can have lungs in two, two separate categories. So we'll learn if you puncture one cavity and you have what's called a collapsed lung or atalaxis, and that lung is not going to be able to expand. You've got the other one that's still working, and you actually can still survive on one lung as long as one lung is working, and you can go and get the other one repaired. So that's good that that, that, situ, uh, that there's two compartments. So this so pulmonary ventilation, and this is uh, actually the the whole thing of the of respiration and transport of gases. I should call it something else in pulmonary ventilation. This pul pulmonary ventilation, what ventilation is, is getting air into your lungs. And getting air out. That's that's you, your ventilating lungs. And then in the alveoli, you have alveolar gas exchange. Oxygen coming in from the uh, air that's in the alveolar into the, in the, into the blood. And CO2 is in the blood, definitely coming into the alveolus. So you have alveolar gas exchange. Then you have gas transport. It's a transport the gas. The oxygen in the lungs throughout the entire body. And then you have a systemic gas exchange on the other end. In the systemic system, and all the tissues, you have another gas exchange uh, where oxygen comes out of capillaries this time and goes into the interstitial fluid and into the tissue. And then CO2, which builds up in the tissue, comes out of the tissue by the interstitial fluid into the capillaries. And then we got gas transport back in the lungs, a real gas exchange again, a pulmonary ventilation again, and we go around and around and around. All right. Here's a figure that shows the four processes. Uh, this is on page 923. Now, this is a little, 
little misleading in this pulmonary ventilation thing. Okay, atmos atmosphere, air uh, containing O2 coming in. Well, yeah, the air that you're breathing uh, right now is 21% uh, oxygen, right? But there's a little bit of CO2 there. It's very small, it's like 0.04%, although it's rising because of global warming, but it's about 0.04%, so it's very low, but there's a little bit in there. And then it says air containing CO2 leaving the lung. Well, yeah, there's a lot more high concentration of CO2 in your exhale breath than, than out here. But is there oxygen in your exhale breath? Uh, yeah, there is actually quite a bit of oxygen in your exhale breath. We're gonna see uh, the consequences of that uh, when we do the group activity, uh, group activity five, um, we, we talk about CPR. Okay, so you got the alveolar uh, gas exchange, uh, um, O2 moves into the blood, CO2 moves into the uh, alveolus, you have a gas transport so containing O2, it also contains CO2. I mean, you can see it's O2 and CO2 on both sides. But it's, uh, so, so you yeah, let's see, you say um, the oxygen blood, the oxygen blood have, have no oxygen? Uh, no, it's got a fair amount of oxygen. But the oxygen blood coming from the left side heart has got a lot more. Uh, and in the oxygen blood, we look at um, the blood is saturated with oxygen, right? It goes back to the tissue. It's got still got oxygen in, just not saturated. It's actually about seventy. In a normal situation, usually about seventy-five percent saturated. Hundred percent saturated coming out, about seventy-five going back in under normal conditions. So you know when you do that pulse ox thing, you can, uh, put that little thing in your finger to look at the pulse ox region. It should be around ninety-nine percent. I mean, uh, when your blood leaves your lungs. Should be like 99, uh, 99 percent uh, saturated. Well, it would immediately be It's gonna be a little less than that when it gets to the tissue, and we're gonna see why that is in a moment. Okay, I checked it again. Okay, systemic gas exchange, exact opposite and other than the lungs. Okay, and then blood containing CO2 and some oxygen coming back to the lungs and we go around and around like this 12 times per minute. You breathe about 12 times per minute. Okay. Okay, let's look at uh, pulmonary ventilation. So we have inhalation and exhalation. So, um, so for, uh, first we um, inhale. And inhaling is an active process. It's an active process. It means you need to use uh, muscle, contracting muscles to do this. And that requires ATP. So you gotta use cellular energy to do this. So uh, acquired inhalation, also called tidal volume. We're gonna get to, to the volumes later on and we're gonna do a whole lab on volumes. Tidal volume, just a normal inhalation. That's it. It's usually about like a half a liter of uh, air. What do you gotta use is your diaphragm. You have to contract your diaphragm to breathe in, all right? And a little bit of extra inter external intercostal. There, the muscles between your ribs. Uh, but if you want to breathe in more, you have what's called a forced inhale. Breathe in as much as you want. Then you got to use um, the uh, the internal intercostals as well, and you got to use abdominal muscles, you use extra muscles to do a forced inhalation. Okay. An exhalation, uh, surprisingly enough, is a passive process. You know which. You don't need to contract any muscle to, to exhale. You just have to relax. So, so you're not using ATP to uh, exhale, to a quiet exhalation. That is tidal volume. In, out. In, out. 
But then we have to take a we have a forced inhalation, you can have a forced exhalation. You can push as much air out of your lungs as possible. Oh, yeah. That's a forced exhalation. That in, uh, requires, that is no longer an act, uh, a passive process. That's an active process. You got to use some intercostals and abdominals to do that. And of course, there's, there's the Valsalva maneuver, which you mentioned before. You generally use to urinate and defecate, is you uh, contract those internal intercostals and abdominals and close your glottis. Uh, so the pressure builds up. Uh, in your abdominal cavity, because you're pushing on it. Like you contract your diaphragm and then you're pushing on your abdominal cavity. Abdominal cavity builds up and helps to push urine and feces out. Okay. So, how does this work? How do we uh, draw air into our lungs, uh, ventilate our lungs? Well, um, let's do the volume change. And now we're going to give, uh, give you the first of what I call the dead guy's walls. Uh, the name that's these guys, Boyle. Boyle's law is the first one. Pressure inversely proportion the size of change. Remember, what causes gas to flow? Uh, the same thing that causes blood to flow, pressure movement. You want air to flow from this, from here to here, the pressure's gonna be higher than it is over here, than in the flow. If the pressure was opposite, the air was flowing the other way. So, pressure inversely proportional to side change. What does this mean? Well, uh, given, say we have a sealed container, I usually talk about the room. The room is all sealed up, but let's make believe the walls of the room. We can move the walls closer together apart of the wall. And given, and the, and the doors are locked so gas can escape. So if you uh, pull the, the side of the room closer and closer together, the, the size of the room changes. And if, and if the gas uh, remains the same amount of gas, pressure will go up. It's what, what it means in inverse of proportion. Given a volume, uh, given a certain amount of gas, the smaller the volume you have in it, the higher the pressure. The larger the volume, the lower the pressure. So we're gonna look at now these three pressures, atmospheric, interpolar, and interpolometer, to see how we get these pressure gradients that first draw air into the lungs, and then push your air out of the lungs. Here's Bohr's law right here. So you got a certain amount of volume of, of fluid. You got this plunger. You pull the plunger up. You increase the you increase the amount uh, uh, the volume of the chamber. The pressure inside decreases. You push down on the plunger. You make the the volume of the space smaller the pressure goes up. So on the right-hand side, you can see the area A, you have area A and area B. Area A stays the same size. Area B, the volume increases. This will suck air from area A into area B. Then we decrease this, the volume of area B, squeeze it together, and this means the pressure it rises up in uh, area B above that of area A, and air is pushed in the opposite direction from area B to area A. That's exactly what happens in your lungs. Bottom left here, volumes and pressures with breathing at the end of an expiration or, or exhalation. I like to use exhalation rather than expiration, because expiration sounds like death. Anyway. So at the end of an, of an exhalation, a tidal exhalation, what's the thing? Atmospheric pressure is about 760 millimeters of mercury. It's a little less where we are here because we're a little bit above sea level, we're like 500 feet above sea level, but a little less, but pretty close. It's 760 millimeters of mercury. 
Uh, and at the end of an exhalation, the, um, the inside of your lungs, the interpulmonary pressure is also 760. So they're the same, so gases are going in. Interpleural pressure is 756, slightly less. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it means a lot. Remember, uh, interpleural pressure is always lower, the lowest one. Okay. So quiet inhalation. What do you do when you, uh, when you inhale? You contract your diaphragm. Your diaphragm pushes down into your abdomen, the thoracic cavity expands. That volume becomes larger now. And so what does that, does that do to interpulmonary pressure? It drops it. As you can see, drops to 759. Like I said, it doesn't mean much, but it's a difference in pressure and that will suck air into your lungs. So, so I inhale now. And now the top of inhalation, actually both sides are 760. And no more air is going in for me. And then I, and then I relax my brain. When relaxing, it pushes up, makes the thoracic cavity smaller. Air pressure goes up above that of atmosphere, and air is pushed out of your lungs. You can see on the exhalation, uh, the top of exhalation 760, uh, when you're ex uh, exhaling 761 above atmosphere, pushes air out. And this is all due to Moyle's law, right? This is an important thing to uh, remember. Okay. Another dead guy's law, Charles's law. This is that the pressure uh, yeah, um, of air is directly proportional. Now, in Bohr's law, it was an inverse relationship. Charles' law, it's a direct relationship. The, the higher the temperature of the gas, the higher the pressure. Because remember, what does temperature measure? Molecular movement. So air that's hotter is moving faster, more violently. And of course, what is pressure? But the molecules of air hitting inside of the container. So to hit the size of the container harder, faster, pressure is up. And the colder a gas is, the lower the pressure. And this actually does assist in inhalation. Uh, so this law does help in, in inhalation because when you bring air into your, particularly if you breathe through your nose, you bring in the air, you warm it up and warm air is into your lungs. And that warm air increases the, increases the pressure. So Charles' law is, it's relatively minor compared to boils, but it still assists ventilation, Charles' law. A pneumothorax, I've already mentioned it, a punctured thoracic cavity. You puncture the thoracic cavity, intrapleural pressure becomes the same as atmospheric pressure, All right? And this causes what's called an atalaxis. I think that's the next thing. At, at, atalaxis, a collapsed lung. And that lung is not going to be able to be ventilated. Doesn't matter whether you increase the size of that thoracic cavity, that intrapleural pressure is 760, the same as the outside. So you're not causing a pressure gradient in that lung, and you cannot ventilate that collapsed lung. You got to go in there and suck that air out seal it up and make sure your pleural pressure now is, is below intrapulmonary. Okay. Let's get to the control of breathing. This is all on pages 926, 927. Now we're on page 928, 929, control of breathing. And this is going to be a control system in the Medulla Abangada, very similar to cardiovascular. And uh, actually, I asked the question about the cardiovascular uh, control system. Boy, I'm going to ask you questions about the uh, respiratory control system. And it's actually a little more complicated than the cardiovascular control system. All right, neural control breathing. The respiratory centers. Where? What is the prize? Medulla oblongata. 
right with the cardiovascular and guys your motor centers are controlled, your breathing center is very awesome. Right. And there's several of them that we're going to have to, uh, to learn. Um, well, medullary, you said they're in the middle of Angara, there's one also in the palms, which is also brainstem. Uh, that's a relatively minor one, but it's still the one that's there. Um, and we're going to have two uh, groups of neurons in the respiratory control center, called one called the ventral respiratory group. And the other one's called the dorsal respiratory group. And then, of course, then there's the pons respiratory group. Okay, in the ventral respiratory group is cycling between inspiratory neurons and expiratory. And this is interesting because the 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 uh, now the inspiratory neurons are stimulated to, to fire, and they are going to send output uh, on the phrenic nerve to your diaphragm to cause to cause the diaphragm to contract when you breathe in. But there's a corollary that goes from them over to the uh, to the expiratory neurons, and if and as the inspiratory neurons fire up and cause the diaphragm to contract. They will also stimulate the expiratory neurons. And the expiratory neurons will come back and have inhibitory synapses on the inspiratory neurons. So as you breathe in, your expiratory neurons are firing up and everything in contracting the diaphragm. They're also turning on the expiratory, which feeds back upon the inspiratory and inhibits them. So you get to the top of the inspiration, and I can't inspire anymore. I can't. Uh, I can get just get to a particular level where I can't inspire anymore. Why? Because my inspiratory neurons are completely shut down by a really great increase in activity in the expiratory. And why that is is to prevent you. This is one of the means that prevents you from overinflating your lungs. These, uh, these little sacs, these alveoli in your lungs are really delicate tissue. I mean, very delicate tissue. And if you over expand, if you over uh, breathe, so to speak, you breathe in too deeply, you could blow them up. This is called barrel trauma. So be like really bad. So physiologically, you're not allowed to do that uh, by the in and hit inhibition of the expiratory neuron on the inspiratory. Oh, I did it again. Okay, brain stem centers. Then there's a dorsal respiratory, which is the integrated center. And it sends its input to the ventral, the, the v, VRG, so we call the VRG ventral spot, and the DRG, the dorsal spot. And here's the thing, remember, this is a feedback system, this is a control system, this is physiology, which means that input to the, to the respiratory control centers, right? And then there's output. You need input, then you integrate that input, you make a decision, and you send output. Well, the input goes into the DRG. We'll talk what the input is in a, in a bit when we look at this figure here on page 929. Uh, but this input goes into the DRG. It integrates it, makes a decision. Okay, what do we want to do? It sends its information to the VRG and either stimulates the inspired or inhibits the inspired depending upon what the input is. Do we got to breathe more or less? Then the pontine respiratory group also has an input to the PRG. It's a, P, a, a PRG. And it's, like I said, it's a relatively minor. Uh, it just uh, it modifies the rhythm of the VRG to what's called eupnea. Eupnea is normal breathing. Normal breathing is about 12 times per minute. 
Um, and a, and a, P, a PNC ensures that. And apparently, when it's in some danger to it, PNC, you get this sort of like ragged breathing. So you don't stop breathing, or you just get ragged breathing. So have a nice smooth inhalation, exhalation through the input from the P, a PNC. Okay. Okay, what is input to the respiratory center? To the DRG, central peripheral chemoreceptor. Um, and these are, these are actually in the uh, hypothalamus uh, and in the carotid sinus and in the arch of the aorta. Just the same ones, the same place where chemoreceptors are that help regulate the, the uh, heart rate and, and basal motor. Um, and um, the, the big thing that drives breathing is pH. And what drives pH is what's called PCO2. It's the partial pressure of CO2 in your blood. Oxygen is a, has a really weak, oxygen really doesn't have anything to do with it. In a normal situation, oxygen does not control your breathing. It seems contradictory. You think, well, we're breathing to get oxygen, but it's CO2 is much more. Because CO2 is linked to pH. Okay. And you have peripheral uh, chemoreceptors and central. The central chemoreceptors in the middle, in the hepatitis, in the hepatitis are actually much more sensitive than the peripheral because they're much more sensitive to pH. Because the, the uh, central uh, uh, chemoreceptors have no protein, it's cerebral spinal fluid, and there's a protein in solution. So it's less buffered. So it's sensitive to really tiny um, pH changes. In the blood, not that sensitive because there are, there are proteins, class of proteins in the blood that are, act as buffers and minimize pH change. So there's, so central chemoceptors have a lot more um, uh, effect on the breathing rate than the peripheral ones. Okay. But what, uh, what other things are inputs to the DRG? Rope receptors. These are strep receptors throughout the entire body and every muscle, all your skeletal muscles will be strep receptors. This is something that gives you proprioception. You know where your limbs are in space. Um, so when you start moving rapidly, exercising or do whatever, these proprioceptors fire off and they inform the respiratory system, okay, this lung uh, wants to run, he wants to do this exercise, we're gonna have to ramp up with respiration. So we gotta fire up these inspired lungs. Right? Uh, then there's baroreceptors, inflation reflex. There are strict receptors also in your pleural uh, 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 cavity and in, in your thoracic cavity, and measures how much you inspire. And the more you stretch those, the more inhibition is sent to the, to the DRG and more inhibition to the DRG because that's called the inflation reflex protection from overinflation. So you're protected that way from overinflation as well. And then there's irritant receptors, sneezing and coughing. Something irritates your, uh, your uh, nasal passages or your, or your uh, and not to pathos, the sneeze or cough, this will change the breathing rate. And then this higher brain center, hypothalamus and limbic system. This is similar to uh, in infection flu on a heart. You get scared, your heart rate goes up. But, uh, if you get scared, what happens to your, your breathing rate? It goes up too. So that's the limbic system, the amygdala, and the hypothalamus. So, and also if you, if you get really upset or something, a strong emotion will also change a breathing rate. But then also, the cerebral cortex has a role. As a matter of fact, the cerebral cortex can send more neurons down to the diaphragm and completely bypass everything. Bypass the entire uh, respiratory system. And I can control my diaphragm 
uh, constant. I can hyperventilate if I want. I can hypoventilate all my breath if I want. But it's limited control, right? It, uh, you, you, you can't do that for very long. So really, it's kind of an ah, it's, it's, um, it's automatic, it's autonomic. You know, if you have to think about it, breathing. You breathe all by itself, don't even think about it. If you do think about it, I want to change you, you can't, to a limited extent. You can't, you know, the kid would say, they're going to hold my breath until I want to talk about it. Go ahead, try that. Try to hold your breath until you're done. It ain't gonna happen. You'll you might hold out so much that you black out, but then when you when you go unconscious, you start breathing. Uh, as long as you're not under water, if you're under water and it happens, you're drunk. Um, or if you hyper hyperventilate, you get so dizzy and, and you're gonna fall over. And that's because you screwed up your blood pH. You're making your blood pH really, really up. That's why you feel dizzy when you have to So you can't do that. Either. So you can't, so it's limited control, but there, there is that cerebral cortex control. Here is the whole schmear right here on uh, base 929. You see all the blue lines are input and see where they go. The DRG, right? That's the integrating center. Uh, we have all the chemo receptors and uh, in the uh, carotid bodies and the heart, there's the peripheral ones. Uh, you got the central ones uh, in the medulla oblongata, they feed into the DRG. You got the irritant receptors, the barrel receptors, and the nasal passages in the lungs, they're in. You got the proprioceptors and muscles, that is going into the DRG. It all goes into the DRG. Remember that. And then the pond, uh, the pontine respiratory group, it has input to the DRG also, but it has input into the DRG as well. And then what is the output of the DRG? Output of the DRG goes to the VRG. I'm just putting things to remember. So the VRG only gets two inputs from the DRG and from the pontine. All the rest of the input goes into the DRG. And then what's the output of the VRG? The phrenic nerve. Two of the respiratory muscles, the diaphragm, intercostal muscles. That's the output of the VRG. Okay. Then, uh, then it has a line, a red line coming down straight up from output from cerebral cortex. But it could also be output from hypothalamus and um, limbic system, but from higher brain centers. See that red line bypasses everything. It goes right by the VRG, and the DRG goes straight to the diaphragm. That's the voluntary control. Uh, if, it's, if it's from the secret cortex, that's the voluntary control. So you can bypass everything if you want. Again, just to a limited extent. Okay, let's talk about uh, pressure resistance in airflow. And we want to talk about this really uh, before. Um, pressure, like I said, uh, differences in pressure are what cause air to flow. So you have to have, so airflow two grades, two factors, you have to have a, a pressure gradient. Difference between atmospheric and trachoma. To breathe in, interpulmonary has to be lower than atmospheric. To breathe out, interpulmonary has to be greater than atmospheric. Now, resistance to flow. This is the same as in, um, as in uh, the cardiovascular system. The greater resistance, uh, 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 greater resistance uh, the more difficult it is for um, airflow. And, and that really refers to the size of the, of the conducting pathways. Uh, constriction, greater resistance to flow, dilation, less resistance to flow. So it's an inverse relationship. So that's bronchial diameter. Right? Greater diameter, greater flow. Smaller diameter, 
less to flow. Also, decrease in elasticity from flies. Your lungs are elastic. And when you breathe in, it's like pulling an elastic band. And then when you when you exhale, it's like you're releasing an elastic band. And your and your lungs uh, 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 collapse onto themselves. Now, if you decrease that elasticity, then you can't inflate your lungs as much as you used to be able to. And of course, this comes with age, uh, uh, but also comes with some some conditions called uh, pulmonary fibrosis, where your lungs become more fibrous and less elastic tissue, and you can't inflate your lungs as much as you once did. So decrease in elasticity will cause decrease, decrease in airflow. And collapse of alveoli. If the alveoli collapse, then that's a stop gas exchange. And that's, we mentioned that about surfactants and freebies. That surfactant is moving made by type two uh, pneumocytes um, to uh, decrease surface tension in alveoli so that they remain expanded. Uh, and then flow delta P overall. Delta P, what's the size? Delta P is the, is the size of the concentration gradient. The, more, the greater the size of the concentration gradient, the more flow we have. Uh, that's a direct relation. R is in the denominator. So the greater they are, the less the flow. It's an inverse relationship. So um, how much do you uh, do you ventilate your lungs? Pulmonary and alveolar ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation. How much do you pull into your lungs? With, with an inhalation. And that and usually if it's just uh, normal, it's about 500 uh, milliliters, about half a liter. Um, but does all that gas get to, uh, to the alveoli? Uh, well, no. Um, less get to the alveoli because of what's called uh, anatomical physiological dead space. It is called dead space. Here's the thing, you, you breathe in and you breathe out using very same passages, right? So uh, when you uh, uh, breathe out, if, even if you breathe out as much as you possibly can, is there still air in my lung? Yes, you can't push all the air out of your lung. That's called a dead space. All the air in the conducting passage is called a dead space. And so what happens is when you breathe, and that's about 150 milliliters. So as you breathe in, you mix the fresh air with the air in the dead space. And so you're really only bringing in about 350 milliliters into your lungs rather than 500 because it's mixing with the anatomical dead space. So that's called alveolar ventilation. Tidal volume minus the anatomic dead space times the respiration rate. So 350 uh, milliliters times 12 times per minute is your alveolar ventilation rate. I should have done that math and figure it out. Anyway, uh, then deeper breathing more effective than fast, faster and shallow. What if you want to get more? Uh, Oxygen into your, in, in, into your body. Should you uh, breathe more deeply and do the same amount, 12 times per minute or more deeply, or should you, or should you increase your breathing rate? Hyperventilate, which is more effective. Deeper breathing, much more effective. Because deeper breathing, you only mix this air with the dead space once. If you hyperventilate, you're mixing it with the dead space a lot more. And we're going to find out that that dead space has a lot less oxygen and a lot more CO2 than the air out here. So when getting oxygen to your uh, lungs more efficiently, what you do is you breathe deeper. Uh, this is called uh, 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 hypertonia uh, rather than hyper, 
then hyperventilation, which is breathing more rapidly, gets shallower. Um, and actually, when you go exercising, you have to run, you still breathe 12 times per minute. You just breathe much more deeply. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right right, right there because I think I've already gone like uh, more than thirty minutes. So let me uh, stop this one and we'll pick it up um, uh, to the next video uh, respiratory three. Hang on a second, let me stop the recording.